Hi, how's it going? And welcome to the Ask Jeff Show, episode number five. So we have some brand new questions this week. The first one comes from Carlo, and he wants to know that if Facebook were to go away, what would you do for marketing and lead generation? That's an easy one. First of all, Facebook's not going to go away, so we don't have to worry about that. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be marketing or doing any lead generation besides Facebook. So if all you're doing is Facebook, that can be a dangerous thing because Facebook can change the rules anytime. So these strategies will work whether Facebook goes away or whether it's still here or if they change the rules, you still should be doing this other stuff. So the first thing is going back to what we did you know, before Facebook anyway, which was uh, good old fashioned email marketing, uh, which has become a lost art and is still the number one seller for me. Uh, you know, it's, once you grow your email list, it's absolutely free to email them. So um, you should be doing more email marketing. So if you are not emailing your list at least three to five times a week, you should be. Uh, you should be. Um, the things you want to email them, you know, just like your Facebook Live videos, you want to email them good content. Um, answer their questions, um, testimonial success stories, and um, and sprinkle lessons in with what you with what you have going on and things that, that you're doing. Um, another way to leverage email marketing is by leveraging other people's uh, list. So not only emailing to your own list, but you want to find like other businesses that serve the same clientele that you do, and um, and make offers, make deals with them to mail out on your behalf. So. You want to leverage other people's list or other businesses. So what I used to do um, is when I first started my boot camp, we started in a gymnastics center. They didn't even have an email list to begin with, so I helped them grow their email list, uh, which was easy because whenever the moms would come in and drop their kids off, they have to sign them in. They just put a spot for them to add their email address, and they were able to get about 5,000 emails in about a little over a month. Um, but um, what I did is I set up a 14-day fat furnace program uh, specifically for them. So at the top, it just said uh, special offer for friends of Rebounders Gymnastics Center. And it was $47 for 14 days. And we gave them 100% of, uh, of the $47 for each person that, that came in. And we set up a special uh, you know, web page just for them so we would know exactly all the sales that came in, you know, came in from their emails. I already rewrote you know, the three different emails for them to just copy and paste, made it really easy for them. You want to make it easy for them to mail out. If they have to think about it and they, have, they don't know what to write, they're probably not going to do it. But if you can just say, hey, I wrote this email for you. Um, could you, you know, could you send it out? Um, they'll, they'll be more apt to, uh, to mail out for you. Um, they mailed out for me the first time. We got like 55, 56 people in and we ended up getting 27 of those to uh, continue on at our full price. So they made a lot of money you know, on the front end. And most businesses are kind of weird about making money that's not inside you know, their business plan. You know? So we have to like, spin it. And the way that I presented it to them was like, hey, I have this program that can help you, you know, raise money for you know, events or competitions, uniforms, um, you know, new equipment, things like that. Because I saw that they were doing fundraisers and they were selling, you know, candles or doing car washes or pumping gas, stuff like that. So I just went to them with a fundraising opportunity. So if you can approach a business that needs to raise funds for different things like that, then um, it makes it easy for them to promote you and, and, mail, and mail out. And it's a win-win for everybody. So that's one of the main things that I would focus on. And I, you know, I did that the whole time, even when I was doing, you know, the Facebook marketing. Um, it's just something like at least once a month having a different business, uh, you know, trying to, to mail out. Um, you can do that with charities. So if you have like small local charities, um, you can do a, you know, like a, you know, a special offer, a special program to raise money for them. Um, most of your smaller 5Ks are backed by charities. So you can kind of jump on board with them and, and sponsor the 5K. And then after the 5K, you know, follow up with a 14 day program and then donate you know, 100% of the money back to, to the charity. Um, and that's a great way to leverage other people's uh, email list. The other thing you want to do is just get involved, you know, in your community, which you should be now. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, you want to be like the authority, not only in fitness, but also in business and, and giving back to your community and just being you know, involved in everything that goes on you know, in your community. So again, like sponsoring the 5Ks or joining like the Chamber of Commerce, um, you know, doing like lunch and learns, grocery store tours, um, things like that where you're just out and about, you know, almost like campaigning you know, for, for your business. 
what I would always do is I would like listen to like the sports talk radio or whatever and if it's like one of the Baltimore Ravens was putting on a fundraiser um, I would go and everybody would like stand in line to meet them and then when they would get there they'd ask them like to sign this football or they'd ask they try to pitch them some kind of opportunity or whatever all I would say is like hey I love what you're doing for these like inner city kids and with your camps and um, you know I'm donating some money today if you know I, I have a business you know, a fitness boot camp, and we would love to help raise more money for your cause. You know, I have a special program that that'll help raise money. You don't have to do, you know, you don't have to do anything. And a lot of times, like their wives are in charge of like the fundraising, so they'll just be, like, oh, that's that's really cool, man. You know, my, my wife's right over here. Why don't you go talk to her about it and give them the details? And um, I actually had uh, two different Baltimore uh, Orioles wives were in my in my boot camp because of that. So just kind of like see where like all the different fundraisers are going on in your community by cele like by celebrities whether they're professional athletes or just like local celebrities um like talk show hosts or, you know radio talk show hosts stuff like that um in in your city go there and then just present them with, a, with an opportunity for you to be able to raise money for them and uh you know and, and then obviously they're going to be mailing out to their to their uh, email list or talking about it on a radio show or whatever or whatever it is and it's got me on the news it's got me on the radio so um, just being really cool and using your platform of owning a boot camp or a gym or whatever you have as a way to give back to the to the community and that's gonna um, do wonders for positioning you as not only the authority in fitness business but also as someone who gives back and, and helps the community so um, those are the two main things that I would focus on If Facebook were to go away, which it's not, but you should still you should still be doing those things um, as well. So the uh, next question comes from Tate. He says, "I want to sell my business in the near future. What steps would I need to take to maximize the sale?" So I actually sold my my business last February, and I made all kinds of mistakes. It was almost like a four-year process trying to sell it. Three different people that potential buyers, and um, so I learned a lot in in the process. The first thing is try to know like you need like a year or two out that you're gonna that you're gonna um, sell it or start running your business you know in a way that's gonna maximize the sale. So what you want to do is making sure that you're showing the most profit as possible. So the first thing in your books, run your company as lean as possible. Show the most profit. That's probably too high. I don't know if you guys can see it. Possible. It's too high. All right. I'll write it again. <laughs> Show the most profit possible. So, like, what I did wrong is, uh, you know, I was joining like Beatrice's mastermind group at the time and traveling all over the place to seminars and learning marketing, and um, I was writing it off through through my boot camp. And um, the first couple of years, I was actually running at you know at a negative because I was spending sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year on travel and and coaching and events and stuff like that. And um, that really made it, you know, look like it was super expensive to, to you know, to run the boot camp. Um, when I was trying to sell it, I had to explain that to, uh, you know, the, the potential buyer kind of understood that, but then their accountant, all they look at is a P&L, and they're like, you know, this company's not worth anything because, you know, it costs way too much, you know, to run it. I tried to explain it to them, and maybe some of them got it, and they understood, and they're like, okay, that's fine. But then when they, when the potential buyer went to the bank to try to get a loan, they want to look at that as well and then you have to explain it to the bank and that doesn't go over so well so it made it really hard for people to get a loan to be able to buy my business um, even though I was able to explain why it was uh, costing so much you know to run it so make sure that you're running you know the business as lean as possible and make sure that, that your books are really really clean and um, the other thing that you want to do is you know at least a year out from selling it is don't take any paid in fools The reason for that is because you're collecting the money for a year up front. Um, so we had about 60 people out of like 258 members, like 60 of them that were on paid in fulls. And the potential buyer, um, you know, you can't sell cash. We did an asset purchase agreement. So any cash in my account that I, would, I got to keep, I was just selling the memberships. So they'd already paid me the cash and no more, no more money was coming in for, you know, six months, seven months, eight months, a year, depending on when they joined, um, when they paid in full. So they wanted to prorate that amount and take that off the sale price. Well, that came out to like thirty or forty thousand dollars. So you're gonna uh, miss out on a lot there. Um, and anybody's accountant um, or lawyer is gonna tell them to do that because they're gonna be servicing those clients, you know, for the next 
until the membership is, is due and then they may or may not join, um, you know, they're going to be doing that for free. So they're going to want to get prorated, you know, the, the amount, you know, for that. So don't collect any paid in fulls um, at least a year before you, you go to sell. Uh, that was actually number two. And then uh, number three is you want to get a good evaluation. And um, you don't want to just come up with the arbitrary number. You want to have a uh, you know a way that you came to that number when you make the offer to you know to the person that's buying it, and you want to make it to where it makes sense. Um, a good company that's very affordable is uh, Biz B I Z Equity dot com. If you go to bizequity.com, it's like 80 bucks and you get a year. You can run as many evaluations as you want. You go through and you just put in all the different numbers for the last three years and um, what your debt is, your bills, your, you know, pretty much your P&L. And uh, it'll tell you where you are with the industry standards and what your evaluation is if you were to actually sell the actual business. Um, with these types of businesses, it's hard to sell the business because what that means is that once the sale is final, all of your back bookkeeping and tax history becomes a new owners and if uh, they were to get audited and something were wrong then it would be on them and not you so there's a lot more vetting that needs to take place and most people just aren't willing to take that risk or want to do all that vetting you know on this small you know type of a business so an asset purchase agreement where you're just selling you know your lease your equipment your um, you know, your your uh, members agreements um, your inventory stuff like that you know, computers, front desk, you know, you put a value to everything and that's what you're selling is, is the assets. Um, you can sell the, you know, the, the rights to the name and all that stuff too as an asset. So more, more than likely you're going to be on an asset, you know, purchase agreement. So it'll tell you the different, if you were to sell it, you know, sell your business, it'll, it'll give you one valuation. If you're doing an asset purchase agreement, it'll give you another evaluation. So go to bizequity.com, it's like 80 bucks, and you can run as many evaluations as you want for a full year. Um, and that, that way it'll give you a good starting point and it'll give you a nice printout that you can sit down with the person and you can go through and see like, look, I'm above the industry standards here, you know, I'm at the industry average here and so forth. And it kind of makes sense why you're asking for, you know, for that amount. So take those three steps um, and you'll be able to maximize and get the most value out of your business and sell it for the highest price possible. And one other uh, quick tip is um, even though I was like traveling a lot and spending all that money on seminars and coaching and stuff like that, um, that was a, you know, a great thing to do. It was just bad that I you know, used my debit card for my gym. So what I ended up doing after that is I just got a um, credit card, a personal credit card, and just put it all in there and then just wrote it off in my taxes personally. Um, that way it didn't show in my books. So that's so you can still... You know, hire coaches, go to events, and write that stuff off. Just get like a you know a credit card that's that's just designated just for that, and then um, that way it's easy to keep all the you know all the transactions separate, and then write that off uh, personally. So that's another uh, another tip. So you can still travel and still go to events and stuff. Cool. So one more one more question. Uh, this one's from Jay. He says that he's looking for a new location. Uh, do you have any tips for finding a location and negotiating the lease? Cool. So. <clears throat> Whenever you try to find a new location, what, what all I would usually do is like I never got like a you know an agent or anything. Um, if it's hard to find you know empty spaces in your area, then an agent might be good because they might know ones that are coming onto the market. So um, my my area there's always plenty of uh, you know locations to to look at and to choose from, um, which can be good or, or you know or bad. But if there's not, if there's not very many available, then I would I would recommend hiring an agent because they may know. Um, some of the building owners, they'll know when some leases are coming up and they'll be like, hey, this place isn't available yet, but in three months, you know, will be, stuff like that. So an agent is helpful there. Um, but if there's, you know, if you see locations with signs in the windows, you don't really need, need an agent. Uh, so what I would do is just drive around town and take pictures of the locations, put their addresses down, get as many, you know, make, a, make as, you know, as big of a list as you can. So one is just, you know, make a list of all the potential locations. And um, so make a list of all the potential locations. And once you have like six, seven, maybe up to 10, you're gonna go through and say like this one, like in a perfect world, this one would be the one I want. If that one doesn't go through, then I would want this one, so you know, second. If that one, next one would be, you know, third, fourth, on down. And then you're gonna go and you're gonna call the, um, the, you know, the last one, the one that you want the least first. You're gonna call them first. And um, talk to the, you know, to whether it's the building owner or the building manager, you know, the leasing company, whoever it is, 
and uh, they might ask you for some financials or whatever before they even start talking to you. So you get all this stuff together and whatever questions they have, you might not be ready or prepared to answer them, which is fine because you don't really care if you get it or not. So you can kind of fumble through it and look like you don't know what you're doing and that's totally cool. Um, but get it all together, go through the process, even though you really don't want that one. Um, and then start the negotiating process as well. And when it, whenever, you, when it, whenever you're gonna negotiate anything, you always want to ask for more than what you would settle at because the way that it works is everybody is, has to give, you know, in order to negotiate. Unless it's like a big, you know, uh, you know, a big real estate company or leasing company that just doesn't care and they have tons of money and their places go by really quick and they're just like, hey, this is, the, this is what it is and there's no negotiating. They'll, they'll tell you up front if there's no negotiating. Then it's up to you to decide whether it's worth it or not for that, for that location. But what I look for is like um, a single owner, like an old timer who used to be an entrepreneur, so he kind of sees himself in you um, and bought the building, you know, and then he retired and then he just started leasing, you know, leasing the building out when he was in his retirement. Um, those have been my best landlords over the years. Um, somebody that used to be an entrepreneur, they can kind of see themselves in you and give you a break and help you out and they're willing to, willing to work, you know, work with you. So I would recommend trying to find um, a building or a location that has an owner like that as opposed to like a bigger company because bigger companies are hard to deal with. But Either way, when you go in, you want to ask for like the moon. So if you only want need three months of ramp up time, don't ask for three months of ramp up time. You're going to ask for six. So um, make a list. You know you're going to visit them or go to them in reverse order. And uh, and then when you go to negotiate, you're going to ask for you know more than what you would settle for. So ask for six months ask for a shorter lease, even though a longer lease is actually better. Most places don't want a longer lease. Uh, I mean, they don't want a shorter lease, they want more security. Uh, most places are gonna want like a five-year lease with like five one-year options um, is what most places want. So I would go and ask them for a one-year lease with like five one-year options, um, just to kind of be crazy and knowing that they're not gonna accept that. But then they might come back with a two-year, you know, with you know five one-year options or something like that. Um, but uh, anyway, the reason that you do that is because if you ask for six months of build up time and they say, well, I can't do six, um, we can only give you three, you never want to say, okay, that's, you know, three works for me, even if that's what you want, because then you, you know, you've accepted without asking for something else. So instead you say, well, three could work, you know, if I could get, you know, this, you know, a shorter lease, you know, the two year lease instead of a five year lease or whatever, just in case I outgrow the place and I want to move on to somewhere else, you know, so, um, so you, could, you, you want to do like a give and take. So if they say, well, we can't do a two-year lease, um, then you can say, well, I could do five-year lease, um, but then I need six months of ramp-up time because I'm putting all my money into the build-out, and if I'm going to be here that long, you know, I want to make sure that I have enough time to, you know, to get everything you know, set up and, and running efficiently. So then you would ask for more months in exchange for the more years. Uh, so it's always a give and take. Never just say okay when they say no to something without saying okay, that's fine. But then if you know that's fine if I can do this or that's fine if you can do that, and that's going to help you out in, in the negotiating process. But you want to go to um, the ones that you don't want first. Start start the negotiating process. See what they're willing to give you. You know, make notes on um, what if they said. Yeah, I'll give you six months. Yeah, I'll give you a two year lease. Um, yeah, we'll pay for some of the build out. Whatever it is, you know, make that list and um, get them whatever paperwork they need, financials, you know, credit, history, whatever, and then go to the next place, do the same thing, go to the next place, do the same thing. So by the time that you get to the one that you really want, you have all the paperwork ready, you're walking in there and if they ask for it, like, yeah, I got it right here, you pull it out of your briefcase or your, back, your bag or whatever, you're like, oh wow, this guy, you know, he knows what he's doing, he's not fooling around. And then you can also play the other ones off, of the, off the one you want. So if they're like, oh, I can't really give you, you know, the three months ramp up, you can only do like a month, and, um, and then you can say, okay, you know, I really wanted to, you know, I really want, love your facility the best and would love to come here first, but the guy, you know, down, at, you know, and say, say the address because all the building owners know who what's available. So when you like call it out, like over on, you know, whatever street, um, he's willing to do this. And, you know, if you could just do this one thing, then I would, I would go with you. So you can kind of play them off, off the other people. They don't, they don't want to lose you to, a, to another, you know, another realtor, another leasing company or another building. So, um, you're going to go into the one that you want, looking way more professional, being way more, more prepared, knowing cause the right answers. Because when you leave the other ones, you're going to be like, oh man, when, when he asked me this, I, I know I should have said that, but I said the wrong thing. So the next time you're, you're prepared, you're ready, and you're ready with the right answer. So um, that's basically, basically it when it comes to negotiating is, and um, you know, go to them in reverse order. And that's just a learning process. So by the time you get to the one you want, you're well prepared, you look like you know what you're doing. 
Um, this also goes for like if you're trying to get a loan from a bank, same thing. Go to like five banks that you don't want to get the loan from and don't have the best deal, and they'll ask you for what paperwork they need, your credit, you know, this, that, or whatever. Um, and then you go and get it, you get it off for them. And if, if you get approved, you don't have to accept the loan. You can go to the next one, the next one. And when you get to the bank that you want, you already know the answers to all the questions. You already, all, already have all the paperwork that, that they need and what they want. And you have that much better of a chance of getting the loan through the bank that, that you want. So you can do that for loans um, as well. But um, just to recap, go through your town, make a list of all the potential places, go to them in reverse order of the one that you don't really want, the, you know, the one that you want the least, go there first, work your way up to the one that you want the most. Use that as leveraging power um, when you go to talk to the, the, to the landlord of the building that you want. Uh, play off the other ones, be like, well, so-and-so at this location is willing to do this. Uh, remember, ask for more than, than what you want so you can settle right where, right, right where you want. Negotiating is always a give and take. Never accept a no without asking for something else in return. You know, so again, like if they say, no, we can't do six months of ramp up time, we can only do three. But like, okay, three months will work if you can do you know, if you can pay for some of the build out because, you know, I need to um, keep my, you know, my, my uh, operating capital up to be able to get up to speed faster, you know, because I don't have the six months. If you can't pay for the, if, if they say, well, we can't pay for, you know, some of the build out, then, then you could maybe go, we'll kind of get four months and, or five months would work, something like that. So it's always a give and take. Uh, never just say no. If they say no, don't, don't just say okay and then go on to the next thing. Always say that could work if and you'll be that much better uh, at negotiating and getting what you want. And that's pretty much it for this week for the Ask Jeff Show. If you have any questions, make sure you, you know, ask them below or send me a message, send me a private message to my page. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them there and then also bring them on the show as well. So thanks, I'll see you guys next week.